We are here today to do the iOS developer survey from 2020. Quite interesting to do this survey and basically stream it live and, and record it on for posterity because I think it's important to kind of like every year pause and reflect on the work we do, the technologies we use, the state of the tools and on all that kind of stuff. So hopefully this survey help us kind of like with the right questions. It just helps us a little bit take this time, this this chill afternoon to reflect on these things, on, on what's the state of our community and that kind of stuff. Uh, maybe we can find some hot takes on this. So, well, all of this is my opinion. If you don't, if you don't agree with it, feel free to, to drop a comment and, and we can chat about it. But it's important to, to do these things so now and then, you know, so... So the survey is a unique chance to find what the community thinks and the state of the development. Yeah, so that, that's fine. Like, I... I I like the results of the survey and how that reflects the community, but I also like to do this just for myself, you know, just to to use this as a tool to to think about what we the state on what we are doing. So Apple is not involved here, yes, of course. Uh, so this is just the community for the community. That's cool. Your survey, your data, and the results will be for you. Okay, and maybe completed in one session. Yeah, so you don't you cannot keep the state between. I guess it doesn't catch anything. Okay. So the first part is about Apple platform development. Remember the all the questions are optional. That's that's good because I don't know if I'm gonna have uh, I'm gonna be able to answer all of them. So we'll see. Are you involved in creating apps for any of the following platforms? This question is not just about coding, it doesn't matter how you're involved in creating apps, it all counts. Yes, so I'm involved in iOS, Mac OS, this twenty twenty no, I didn't do any Swift on the server this 2020 at the start of it, but me, that barely counts. That barely counts. So let's do this. What kind of Apple platform apps have you been involved in creating in the past 12 months? Um, well, we can hit A, we can hit B, open source projects. Yeah, I really sell really some of them. Nothing educational, professionally, as uh, employee of a business. That sounds good. And this is, yeah, cool. What is the balance of Swifty Objective-C code that you have written in your personal hobby? Apple personal, not personally, yeah. It's 100% Swift. Like, I don't write Objective-C anymore for my personal things. Like, there is zero reason for that. Like zero, absolutely, there is no reason to write Objective-C nowadays. What is the balance of Swift Objective-C code that you've written f for your business? Okay, so for your business, uh, it's probably be between 70 and 80%. Yeah, it's probably around this. I guess this year, to, to, yeah, I write around 80. So we still, we still have uh, Objective-C, but we are kind of like everything new is in Swift. So some things... Yeah, around the wallet section and that kind of stuff, it's still in Objective-C and I have touched that and there is, it's no problem, you know, like Objective-C, it's a splendid language, it's it's been working perfectly fine, I don't have anything <laughs> against it, it's one of the languages I love, to be honest, uh, but yeah, like we try to write Swift as much as possible. And the balance between UIKit and Swift UI on your personal, okay, so that's one interesting because some people will probably disagree with this, but yeah, in the past year, like, personal, 100% of UI. I haven't written a line of UI kit in a personal hobby, unless, mm, I don't know, maybe you count one random view that I was, I had to jump on UI kit to do it, but yeah, the whole point was, like, I've written everything 100%, and in the last, in the last projects, it's always been 100% of UI, 100%, so yeah, that's good. On your business, sadly, I can just say probably a two because we still support old operative systems, so we cannot use Swift UI as of yet. But we have done some internal tools that I've written, uh, and for that I've just used Swift UI. So let's say uh, twenty percent or a two. How would you rate your satisfaction with Swift as a programming language right now? Swift as a programming language right now, not satisfied, very satisfied. I have to put a nine. Basically, well, to, to be honest, like it depends what they mean for this. Like, as a programming language, 
yeah, it's probably 9.5, 10, almost 10. I guess the tools are gonna come later. So for this, I'm literally just gonna say like, because what are the grievances that I have with the language itself? The only grievances I have is that I wish all the things from Swift Evolution were implemented right now, you know, which that's not, it's not feasible, you know, we need to give time to the language to keep growing. So I'm just going to put a 10 here because, yes, I don't have any problems with the language, honestly. Like, the things that are problems with the language is, like, yeah, things that just need to come on, their, on its own time, so I don't think it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue. Which of the following statements do you agree with? Swift language is in good hands at Apple. Why not? Like, it kind of bothers me a little bit, this question. Because I'm, I've said many times in, in Twitter, my videos, the blog, that it bothers me a lot that still people think of Swift as an Apple thing. They created it, they are behind, they maintain it, but it's open source. There is a lot of people outside Apple that has contributed to it, and it's doing great things for the language. And it's not owned by Apple. So it bothers me that we as a community still think in that way because we are limiting ourselves. Every time somebody that wants to refer to Swift mentions Apple, we're doing something very, very, very wrong. You know? And it's something that we will come to realize sooner or later. It's and it's it's a very sad state of affairs, to be honest. But I think Swift is in good hands at Apple. Yes, I think there is great people working on the language, and I don't think Apple has anything to do with if it's a good like the direction that Swift is taking. The, the only the only thing you can see Apple doing something about Swift is is kind of like on the release cycle because they want to hit up that DC. Apart from that, I don't think there is anything around it. Is the Swift evolution process working well? Yes, I don't think it's working. I don't think there is any problem with Swift evolution the process itself. I think it goes well, the decisions they took with changing it, so you require an implementation and stuff like that. I think it's it's been good. It has like time has proved that it's actually it was a very good decision. And and things are going very well. I can say I like there's been a couple of things, but it's like just when you put a lot of people with different opinions on the same place, <laughs> you know, like things happen. You know, that's it's not a problem with the process, you know? The only thing I would probably would like is to have more different working groups. I said before, like Rust has a, a pretty cool model with that, where they actively work in different aspects of the language with different people and different working groups. So there is always something actively happening in the different aspects of a language, not only random things in one. But uh, thanks to the well, the roadmap that they mentioned for for Swift six we can start seeing that happening, you know, like with this, with the synchronous work and, and the memory management stuff. Like we can start, like the beginnings of that happening, you know? So I'm pretty, pretty cool with that. Swift Evolution is guiding the language in the right direction. Yes, absolutely. I think they are doing a very good job. The Swift core team knows exactly what they are doing. And the only, as I said before, the only problem we have with Swift Evolution is that we all wish it was way faster, you know? But that's not a problem. That's just the nature of things. You know, things take time to take time to be done. And I don't think that's a, that's something that we should like take as a, a negative thing, you know? It's it's still young, so we're still we, we need to wait for some of the things that are coming. And the cool things are coming soon and that's it. So I think if, and the other aspect is like it, like people keep saying that, that it's getting complex, that it's they are comparing with C++ when most of the time these people doesn't have, like, doesn't even know C++. It's just like a meme by now. But I don't think it's it's complex. Like, it's a, it's a language that is really well designed and you can get the f as far as you want, you know, and you can stop as soon as you want. So pretty easy to learn and uh, it takes time to be a, a very a master of it, like to master it. But I think that's the beauty. You know, you have to have both things. If it was super simple, we will we will be asking of it things. So I, I think it's very good. Is becoming easier to use as the language matures? I think so. Again, they are adding more features, which is the next one. It's more capable as the language matures. Yes, and I don't think these two things are contradictory. 
Some people will think that, but they are not at all, because they are adding features on the language to make to make it easier to use. So I think, yeah, for now, we're going okay. Yeah, Swift is becoming more complex as the language matures. Again, it's not becoming more complex, it's becoming more capable, and it's a tool that you need how to use, and it's a tool that you need to, to master, you know? But if you don't want to master it, you can still write everything that you want. You know, that's that's like that's fine. It's not a problem at all, I think. If I could write all the code for every person, yes, of course I will. First party library framework code should be compatible with Objective C. First party. So that means Apple should be making frameworks in Objective C. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. I mean I guess. Yes, you know, third-party code, no, like third-party code, I'm sorry, like, well, like, third-party third code involves that there, like, a lot of it, it's open source, the community with its free time, even if it's not free time, if it's, like, sponsored by a comp uh, company or, or companies that do make libraries and they want to open source, like that, still, those companies don't gain anything, you know? And, and that people, they don't gain anything but making just more work to be compatible with Objective-C. And as somebody that has been, like, at, still nowadays, spent a lot of time making things compatible with Objective-C, because as I said before, the, our biggest code base is still a mixed code base, so we still need to take Objective-C into account. It's a big effort to do that. So I don't think third-party libraries should bother with that, you know? We are moving on, we are going into Swift, Objective-C is still there, and really, if you want, as a, as a, as a developer, if you use a third-party library that it's not compatible with Objective-C, you can just write uh, like a layer or, or, or open source, uh, make a PR, whatever you want, you know? So like, it's not that like it's dead, you know? Objective-C is still there and you can work with it. But I think it's just a trade-off of time and effort, and I don't think it's worth at all that third-party code still supports Objective-C, in my opinion. Of course, if it can, why not? You know, like, why not? But considering the effort and knowing from first hand the, the effort that it takes, I don't think it's worth it. Now, first party, I think first party being Apple, the company that it's behind the tools and, and the interest that they have to make everything successful and to help developers be successful, at the first glance, I would say yes, they should try to make the first party libraries Objective-C compatible. But at the same time, we have that thing about Apple pushing things forward. And there is, this is no different here. Even if it bothers a lot of people, I think that amount of people gets smaller and smaller by day. And if they can focus more efforts on the future, I think that's always better than wasting them in the past, you know? So I won't hit any of the two, even if first party, pro, like I will agree that probably that's a fair one, but I don't think, I don't think it's worth, I don't think it's worth. Uh, what other languages have you written code in during the past 12 months? The past 12 months, I don't remember when I read the blog uh, so here, Latin language in which you have written more than a few lines in it. That's the thing. Like I've written, I've written Rust, but I don't think it's like oh, I've been developing with it. You know, uh, I've I've even written Lua. You know, <laughs> but like just for a small thing. I don't think you can uh, or PHP. You know, like like JavaScript. I've written a bunch of JavaScript for the website. But the majority of it was last, yeah, I don't know. I think I'm not going to click anything. I haven't written in any code, in any of the other languages. I, like, I'm a, f a Swift developer, honestly. Uh, as the, ones, the ones you know me, I know, like, I, I like many languages. I like programming languages as a concept, as something that I love. It's, it's one of my hobbies, you know? That's why I'm so into Swift. And I've, and I've done things in Rust, in, in Kotlin. I've written some Kotlin, but just mainly to help my team. So, you know. I don't think I can consider that I've written a lot of that. But for everything that I had my own choice and, and need more than a few lines of code, 
what is a few, you know, if it's two, then yes, I've written in pretty much all these languages. But if it's a considerable amount of code, no, I, I, I want Swift everywhere. That's, and that's what I, what I do. What architecture patterns do you currently use in your personal hobby apps? Architecture patterns. For hobby, yeah? For the hobby, personal projects and that stuff. MVC, nope, because I don't write uh, UIKit anymore. I just use Swift uh, UI and that doesn't have. It's not MVC, it's not MVM. Uh, could consider MVVM in Swift UI. It's quite, I mean, it's decent. Viper, no, never. It's probably the worst thing that happened to the AS community. Rips, uh, kind of the same. Clean Swift. Whatever you mean by that, I mean, people like to put names into, like, all of this is clean, you know, so whatever you say. Coordinators, not on personal hobbies, unsure, no, I'm pretty sure. And the answer is composable architecture. That's it. Like, it's super easy. You know, this, like, every personal project that I start is in Swift UI first, and it's using point-free composable architecture. That's it. Like, there is... I struggle to see a reason to not do that. I struggle. Like, if it was a super simple thing, one screen or stuff like that, you could consider just going MVVM. For example, you can, like, I can still see MVVM if you want to, like, for example, I've done it when I write blog posts and you want to convey an idea. It's not even MVVM. It's just, dude, just you have your view and you make uh, an observable object with the data in there. You know, you want to call that MVVM go but that's it but like outside of example things i nowadays i don't see any reason to not use composer architecture for your projects pretty much that's it you know so that's what i've been using for this past year everything i do that it's more the than a test than an example it's composable architecture and it's absolutely gorgeous and if you don't know what it is i have some videos on my channel but honestly i will be I would be very bad if I didn't point to these guys. If you want Composer Architecture, just go to these guys, give them some money because it's really worth it. And you have everything here about it, you know? If, if you want to watch on my channel, I have not, ma not much, but there is some stuff here that you can learn from it with some interesting things like uh, time travel and stuff like that. But honestly, for me now, like, it's, and, and the best thing is that just by giving this answer to Composer Architecture, like, you, you free so much mental burden. It's incre it's crazy. Like, I remember, like, before, it's like, oh, what architecture do you use? MVP, MVVM, and then what's the difference? Like, honestly, they are also, they are different names for kind of the same thing. It, it, the, the changes here, when you boil down what the architecture gives you, they are so small, you know, that I've had conversations with many people and at the end it's like, well, yeah, you call this object view model and I call this object presenter, but we're doing the same thing. So I know it's not exactly like that, but bah. and then these things that are, are just like people, I don't know, pretending, <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to comment on this because I think it's, it's insane. But if you can, trust me, just go compose architecture and you won't regret it. Now, in your business, in your business is a different story. Personally, as like I'm saying, we have an old application. It's a six year, six or more, probably seven by now, old application that started in Objective-C. It started with um, MBBM, uh, World Architecture application to that That's why it has been surviving for so many years and we haven't had to do a major rewrite at any point. We have always keep evolving it. And it's one of the things I'm most proud of, of my work. How is that going? That's with MVVM uh, and coordinators. And that's it. And with these two things, super maintainable. We don't have major issues. Uh, we're slowly migrating to Swift, but there is nothing major. Will I switch to point free architecture? Yes, but once you are in a team with a project that it's constantly being released, with a, with a release train that doesn't stop, you need to be very careful with what technologies do you introduce. I mean, 
I'm the boss in there. So I could say, yes, from now on, we all do this because I love it. But so I will never do that to my team. Eventually, we probably will switch. Yeah, I don't know. But first, I think there are way more important things that just change the architecture because you love the new toy, you know? That's not a proper a proper engineering decision, in my opinion. So, MVVM and coordinators. I couldn't imagine really working without coordinators. I think from this, the most important pattern here is the coordinator pattern. I think it, it unlocked so many things in the iOS developer mindset, you know? But between this, I really don't care what you use. You know, like these three things. Yes, of course, one is more testable and stuff like that, but it doesn't really matter. For the rest, yeah, whatever you want. I don't know. Your career, okay. So remember that everything is optional, so I'm probably gonna be skipping things. How long have you been involved in creating apps for Apple platforms? Between 10 and 15 years. You create apps professionally, how big is the company? Uh, we are more than 500, yeah. We, when we started, we were only 15, now we're like thousands, you know, because we, we got that guy acquired. If you create apps professionally, what is the current team size of your iOS or mobile development team? So, we're five, right? Fewer than five, between six. So what is the five? What do I do? Who wrote this? <laughs> Fewer than five, between six and ten. So if we are... If we are five, you can. I cannot answer this, right? Anyway, I mean, with me we are six, but I'm gonna say five. How would you rate your satisfaction with the Apple platform development right now? And that's part of your career. So how do I have to interpret this? How do you rate your satisfaction with Apple? I mean, it's it's probably the best that it has ever been. You know, I cannot go higher than this because the tools. Eh, you know, we, we 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 always like better tools, but I need to give it an eight, probably an eight to be honest. Over the past twelve months, has your satisfaction with Apple platform development? I mean, stayed about the same, not what happened in the past twelve months. I mean, we got WC with widgets. I mean, the new computers probably increased. Yeah, let's say it. Conference and meetups. <laughs> That's gonna be interesting. How many different iOS or mobile development conference meetups have you attended in the past 12 months? I mean, including online events. Uh, none. I really... No, I haven't. When considering attending a conference, which one of the following factors are important to you? I have not considered attending a conference. I mean... Honestly, I see very little point in like the classic way of doing conferences. The online ones, maybe they are more interesting, but whatever. The cost, the speakers, are they diverse? Are they people I trust? To be honest, for me, this is one of the best, like the main points, you know, it's like people that I've been following for a while that I know kind of like the way they see things. Like even if development seems to be like, like, we think that it's like mathematics, there is one way of doing things, that's not true, you know. So it's, I think it's really important to, like, the people that you listen to, that you really trust them, you know, like, and it doesn't mean you need to shut down everybody else, that's not my point, but, I mean, from a conference where I don't know anybody, and a conference where I can hear, I, I don't know, like, people from Point Free, people from Objective-C, IO, like, like the, the choice is clear for me, you know. And of course, there is a lot of people that, are not them. I'm not going to mention them all because we have so many people in the community that are, are lovely. That's, that's one of the things I am always surprised when I talk with Android because they have that Jack Burton, I don't know. It's like the Android God. They always talk about him and nobody else. It's like if you if you ask for names to an iOS developer that it's involved in the community, we're going to say so many because seriously, there is so many great people in the community. Probably on Android there are two <laughs> but they, they always talk about their god. <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, the topics, brand new technologies. I mean, that's not. I don't really mind if the topics are interested. I don't care if it's new or not. Now, if the topics are new to me, yes, because otherwise, what's the point? Uh, wide range of topics. No, I don't care. I just care that it's interesting for me. The content is narrow, specific set of topics. Again, I don't care. 
it's some place I would like to visit. Like, if I could travel, yes, I guess. Is it close? I mean, if I cannot travel, yes, I guess. But to be honest, it's skipping the important questions. How important is that the DC week to you? Uh, it's important to follow along with videos, yes. Oops. Well, if it was multiple choice, why do you skip? It's important to be in the city. No, not at all. Like, I know it's a social event or whatever, and that's why people, but, like, it's not worth it at all. <laughs> like, the, exp the expense for that, especially for people that it's not in from the States, it's insane. Like, it's not worth it at all. How did you rate being an online event? Then. Like, for me, it's the best thing that could have happened, honestly. Like, it was more enjoyable. It w the, the, the event itself, like, the, the keynote, it was super cool. Like, the probably one of the best keynotes. Even if the content was, the, like... Not as important as when they announce Swift and when they announce Swift UI and stuff like that, but I loved it, you know. And it put us, it put everybody on the same kind of ground level where we all knew what was happening at the same time and stuff like that. I think, I think every like yes, should be online all the time. You know, it does. It, for people that likes to talk about this, like it avoids discrimination, you know, because that this is expensive think and not everybody has the means to do that so if it was for me just just do it online forever i i think just in person events and stuff like that these kind of things they are just interesting for people that wants to go and look for business opportunities for the rest there are other ways of getting everything from it you know being a social or being knowledge you know both things there are other and better ways of doing that Development. That's where it starts being interesting. Rate your current personal level of interest in developing iOS apps. I mean, it had to be 8 and 9, right? And it's not a 10, because a 10 I interpret as like, yeah, that's my only thing, and it's not my only thing. But I'm like, yeah, of course, I'm interested. It's, it's my, you know, it's what I love. It's what I love. Let's put that right. Rate your business current level of interest in developing iOS apps. I mean, this is kind of binary if they want or not. I mean, as far as I know, they want. Otherwise, uh, guys, I'm in trouble. Have you been involved in shipping any new apps or new versions of existing apps? Both things. Like, I'm the... As I said, I'm the lead and I, I'm involved in all these things. Even if I, my team is ultimately the one that is empowered to do the releases and all the stuff. But, of course, I'm involved in it. If you have been involved in shipping, uh, 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 what technologies are where those apps develop with? I mean, shipping like doesn't matter, personal or non-personal. So yeah, mm, yeah, a little bit of combined core data, not floating. No, 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 uh, no. There you go. If you are going to start developing a new iOS app today, do you in the next twelve months? What technologies would you use? So if you I combine. Uh, widget kit, probably city kit. Depends on the app, I guess I would use cloud kit, home kit, core data. I probably wouldn't. I probably wouldn't, to be honest. I probably would just go with uh, raw SQL storage and and that's it with one of these SQL cool libraries. I think core like the model layer is the next step that Apple needs to take into account. To get a new a new first party framework i think they have to do some something like again like many people love score data I, I i like it but it's not my you know i'm not a super fanboy like many other people are you know like the way i've always treated core data is it's very careful you know i always consider core data as a polluting framework uh, and what i mean by that it's if you use it at as it's intended to be used, it means you need to use the core data models, like the managed objects, everywhere in your app. Because that's that in that way, you profit from all the benefits from it, like automatic updates, uh, faulting, and all that stuff. But if you do that, you're polluting your app everywhere. You like the th controlling the threading; it gets very tricky if you start passing core data objects that have access to the managed context and to the to the core data store from everywhere from your like UI and look like, whatever it gets super tricky it gets super tricky so I've always considered that like a bad practice 
Cordite is a very bad framework if you use it as it seems the way it's intended. You know, like for example, the fetch resource controller and all the stuff. What the fetch resource controller does is they want you to put that on the view controller, on the UI layer, and use those objects on the UI layer, and that's a no no. That gets super complicated and, and very dangerous. That's my take. So I consider it a polluting framework. What do you do with polluting frameworks? You put them in a layer that you don't see ever. So that's how I do it. Like I have like the model layer inside there, you do core data and you do whatever you want. But when it gets outside, please just give me plain data. That's it. In in the old days, it was kind of like a DTO with an Objective-C object that didn't have anything to do with core data. And nowadays it's probably structs. So that means you not benefit from so much things about core data because core data gives a lot of cool stuff. True, but I don't care. Like just literally like core data, it was designed to be like all your model layer with all the relationships and faulting all the stuff. And literally the only thing I really want is to persist things. Uh, so that's why I think you notice the time, like the, the time when core data was developed. I don't think nowadays it's a very great idea to, to use it in this way, you know, but I'm probably there might be like, I'm not saying there is no good reasons. I'm just saying you need to be very careful with them. And I say Cordena, I say any other framework, like Realm is like 90% of the same still applies. So it's not core data. It's this idea of a database framework that wants to be everywhere. You know, that's the problem there. It's, it's, it's the way it's designed. That's the problem. These intentions. So what drives a new version release for your personal hobby? Uh, new technology, regular release schedule. When, oh, yeah, one time allows. Yeah, for personal projects, one time allows. For your business, regular release schedule. We release every two weeks. We have a sprint of two weeks at the end of the sprint. We basically create a release candidate and then we ship it to the App Store. Our release process is fully automated and quite cool, to be honest. Like, I'm quite proud of what we accomplished in that aspect. So yeah, it's 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 quite interesting. Personal hobby, it's minimum version to support in your personal hobby. iOS 14, like for personal hobbies, really. What's the point of releasing something today supporting old versions? And would the, for your business, if I'm not mistaken, we're still on iOS 12. Yeah. Yeah, I would love us to switch to 14 because we could use all the new things. We probably can drop 12 soon and switch to 13. But because 13 and 14 support the same devices, my wish is that we could just go to 14. But for now, we're on 12, which is not bad. You know, it's just that we cannot use Swift UI and Combine, basically, and, and stuff like that. Have you been involved in shipping any new apps or new versions of existing apps for macOS? Yes, in my personal hobbies. Have you been involved in shipping new apps for watchOS? Nope. It's a platform that it's not really of very interest for me. TVOS, nope. Same. I mean, it's interesting and everything, you know, but you have a limited time, <laughs> you know, so. You need to dedicate it on specific things. Uh, so on, I said in the past month, I did something in the beginning of the year before all the shit happened, but no, I, I have to say no. Machine learning. Oh, really? Write your business school on machine learning. The business interest, I mean, quite high, to be honest. What category problem are you using machine learning to solve? Content recommendations and kind of behavior prediction. Yes, I'm not super involved with that side of it, but yeah. How important is machine learning to your business plans? I would say quite high. I mean, it's, you know, I don't agree with all the hype about it, but I guess everybody. Yeah, interesting person on machine learning. That's probably one of the big, big mistakes that I'm not, it's not a mistake, it's just that I'm not that interested, you know? I would say a three. Three or four, to be honest. I'm not very interested in it. Yeah, I would say a four. I think that it's it's a hype train that I love. I lose, basically. I think it's something that yeah, 
if the time arrives, like everybody will have to learn something about it. But I'm not, I don't have the time and the energy to spend kind of on this time of it when everything is started. It's, it's still, you know, young and being developed. Probably it's something that I will regret at some point, but it seems that it's clearly the future, you know? But honestly, I have other priorities. Humans, you will eventually be taken over by the machines and AI that we helped create. Congratulations, you made it as far as the light heard the questions. Yeah, you did a joke. I know it's a question, a joke question, but... I don't know. I'm usually... In topics of AI, I'm kind of pessimistic. So I have to say yes. The third answer is interesting because in some aspects we already taken over it. You know, like people lives by the phones, you know, like social networks have polluted our, our society. So in some aspects, we're already by it. But I consider that more as a problem of humanity. You know, it's like it's not a problem with the technology. It's like we are just we are just a species with a lot of problems. But I think yes, eventually. I hope not, but I think eventually. Augmented reality. Okay, that one is gonna go quick. Current level with today's hardware. Oh, the questioners did it properly. With today's hardware, uh, augmented reality we're talking. I mean, it's cool. It's a cool concept, but me. Business, I mean, as far as I know, nothing. I don't know. How important is AR in your business feature? Uh, probably, I mean, it depends on where the technology goes, you know, I don't know. How important is plans if Apple announced shipped some kind of glasses? If Apple plans generally change your plans related to AR? I don't think so. I don't think it will change much, you know. Because the use cases... Like, it unlocks some use cases, but not as many as people think in the short term, you know? I don't know. I will put a five. Okay, so developer tools, I guess. This is why we are here for, right? So let's see what they have for us. In your personal hobby, do you use SwiftUI? In your business apps, do you use UIKit? I guess you need to put both. Ah, didn't they say that it was multiple, everything was multiple choice? Anyway, how do you feel about Xcode as a developer tool for, eh, that's the tricky one, right? That's the tricky one. I mean, do I cry every day I have to use Xcode? Yes. Yes, is there anything better there? Hardly. To be honest, the only problem I have with Xcode is the compilation times. And that's barely an Xcode problem, you know? I have to say an eight. Nine and 10 will be unrealistic because I complain about it pretty much every day. That doesn't mean that I'm not happy with it. You know, I feel, I feel quite positive with it. So I have to give it an eight. You know, I wish they improve some of the performance things, but I have to give it an eight. What code editing tools do you use to develop for iOS? Blah, blah. So I use Xcode. I use Visual Studio Code for kind of anything that I don't need Xcode for. Like for merging, for example, I use I use Visual Studio Code as a merge tool because I think it like with the merge, the Git merge plugin, I think is the best thing, to be honest. The merge, merge system that I found. I, I want to see the text and act manually manipulate it. I don't like these UI applications that Sometimes it's very hard to know what you are merging into and stuff like that. But yeah, the Visual Studio Code plugin is probably my the best thing. Mm, cool. What debugging tools do you use when developing platforms? I mean, LDBBX code, instruments, reveal. Yeah, I use. I mean, it's been a while. I don't use reveal because the parts of the code base I've been working didn't need it. But yeah, something that. It's an it's in our tool set. Which of the following statements do you agree with? Apple makes it easy for me to learn Swift. 
Yes. This one, like, maybe people disagree, but if you want to learn Swift, just go and read the Swift book. That's it. You don't need anything else. Just go and read the book. And even, don't touch even the computer. Like, if you want to learn Swift, sit on the couch, read the book. First step. Don't touch the computer. Just read the book. Learn from it. And even if uh, even if you see, if you come from other languages, like, well, I know what it's an if statement. Just read the book. You're going to learn parts of the language that, even if they are not useful to you on your first days, they're going to be on the back of your head, you know? And you're going to remind remember them. So, you want to learn, read the book. So, yes, Apple makes it easy for me to learn the book. Then, open Playground, start playing with it, feel it, you know? And then make a AI application, stuff like that. I know that a lot of people try to, to go the other direction. You know, everybody learns differently. I'm probably the exception on this. Apple makes it easy for me to run iOS development. See, I don't know this. I mean, the the tutorial that I'm actually doing, which probably today we're not going to do a stream about it. But this tutorial is quite good and it's about iOS development, so I have to say yes. The community makes it easy for me to learn Swift. So, that's an interesting question. Because yes, there is a lot of content, we have a lot of good people creating content on the community. But if I started from scratch... And again, like a lot of people comes to me asking me... Like, what do I read? What tutorials do I follow? Things like that. So... Like, I'm just afraid that typical problem, you know, in the internet, that there is so many people creating content with little guidance on what's good and what's bad, that maybe this is not true, you know? But I think we all know that, you know, like, if you do a search on Google, like, I think there is good content well positioned, so people, like, will find it easier to do these things, especially that many years before. So I think I have to say yes. And same for this. So yeah, I think we have a great community. Three aspects of AI program documentation and the double should prototype. <laughs> documentation. Remember when the documentation was awesome? I remember when I started doing iOS development, I was telling everybody, yeah, because the documentation is so awesome. They make guides. I remember I always saying, they make guides. They just they don't just document the API with a header doc and stuff like that. No, no, they make guides. So they explain you what how to do things. That was insane. That was insane. You know, I remember like everybody from other other platforms was like, what? That's super cool. Yeah, yeah, that was insane. Sadly, I mean, some of the things lately they have been done like on Swift UI. They have put some good guides on how to use data and stuff like that. So it's not that bad, you know, but the completeness of the API reference is something that I don't understand how they can ship new frameworks and not like just fill the header docs at least, at least that, just describe what the classes are doing and stuff like that. It seems insane to me. Like if you open something in Swift UI, there is no information. It seems insane, but whatever. Uh, yeah, this, this, that, that's what I was referring to. Like they are quite some decent ones lately, but please keep keep doing it. Uh, yes, I will love more books. Ah, it says that it, blog posts or articles covering the details. The top three, okay, that's tricky. I mean, this one for sure. Now, now I, I need to think about myself, you know, like if, if, if I'm thinking about novice people that's starting, probably sample code and, and stuff like that, it's better. But for me, for me, the complete list, content from... Yes. Yes, please. Yes. Because the problem is that on .dc, they explain many things that are nowhere else. Literally. Like, if, if you've been following me for a while, you know that I am quite strict on watching everything, like, as much as I can from .dc. And when you do that, you realize there is so much stuff they don't explain on documentation anywhere else that unless you were watching that or unless somebody has picked it up in the community and has spread the word it's insane the amount of things that they explain there that are anywhere else so these two for sure the third one it's tricky because i would like some official books but of course i also like articles 
but how a specific task don't I don't know that I feel like why I don't like Apple it's the same thing for the sample code because the target audience historically it's not it's not the right one you know it's like when they do when they were the did guys for NBC. Everybody was trashing Apple because they were telling you to use NBC. And that's the right thing. Like, if you're starting, use NBC, nothing else. Of course, when you have a huge team and application and stuff like that, you need to consider different things. But to start, you need to learn NBC. So that's why I think the target from Apple, it's more focused on a wide audience. I don't think that's super useful to spend your time on from my perspective. You know, of course, as I said, for somebody who's starting, like, if you're starting, please click these two things, <laughs> you know. So I guess I will click this. Should be why. Woo! Personal level of interest, then. Easy. Your business current level of interest in Swift UI. I mean, the business doesn't give a crap. So I'm going to skip that. Have you shipped any new apps or new versions of existing apps? Yes. Are you planning to use SwiftUI in the products you are developing in the next... Yes. Yeah, yeah, SwiftUI is the future. That's it? You're not gonna ask me about anything else in SwiftUI? Oh man, that's disappointing. That's disappointing. What a missed opportunity to ask about... I don't know, like if it has changed the way you do things, if it has... if you like the learning curve, things missing on the API, I don't know. I don't know, it would be interesting to know what people think about that, you know, because maybe the community thinks this is shit, I don't think so. Or maybe the community thinks that there is a lot of things missing, when in reality, mm, like, some of them are missing, but not many. I don't know, anyway. Dependency management, oof, that's boring. How do you approach code dependency in your apps? Third-party code should be awaited whenever possible. A few carefully selected high-quality libraries are fine. But why you continue? Don't continue, bro. The number of libraries isn't important as long as they are high quality. I mean, when you put it this way, I have to disagree. Because saying that they are high quality, it's like not saying anything. I mean, if you can ensure me that there is never a zero problem until the app dies, fair enough. But that's a super high bar. So no, I have to disagree. Like, adding a lot of libraries, it's a problem. It's code that you have to maintain sooner or later. So no, I think if someone has wrote code to do what I need, then I don't have to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good mentality. You're not gonna get that far, mate. If you use third-party code in your personal hobby apps, what dependency manager do you use? With package manager, lol, kids or models. I mean, why not? If you use third-party code in your business, what dependency manager? Okay, so we're using CocoaPods. But over Christmas, we have done a, like a little research into what's going to take us to move to Swift Package Manager. And we already have a couple of things moved. So I'm going to put this too. Use the dependency manager. Also, was there an option to say I don't use the dependency manager? I manually integrate third-party code. Yeah, I guess that's the one. If you use a dependency manager, but you do not currently... Well, then I guess I have to select that, because some stuff, I just put it directly, because I want to have full control over it, so yeah. If you use a dependency manager, but you do not currently use the Swift Package Manager, why not? Yeah, okay, so that's interesting. Current dependency management solution works well enough. Some third-party libraries are not supported. Internal dependencies do not support yet. Yeah, some... Yes, yes. There are, there are still missing things on the Swift Package Manager, which is the kind of delaying the adoption, you know? I think Rx has a big issue with it, and so everybody that's using Rx, you are in trouble, I think, unless something changed recently. But overall, I think by the next year that we answer this question, it's going to be, yes, we're using all the package manager and we're, we're not looking back. Because it's, it's a very good tool. It just, again, still needs some time. 
How many libraries? The not many, true. For my personal projects, three and five, not many. Your business, there are more than ten. Yeah, there are more than ten. It's not project, and we have yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like if you open the pod file, there are more than 10 lines in there for sure. I don't know how many, but there are like so and some of them are just for testing things or or tools that are not deployed on, on the production release. But there are more than 10 for sure. Testing. How important is manual QA testing to the quality of a shit tab? Do we have to get the versions? I mean it's it's important. I don't think it's as important as some people want to make the world believe. But I think it's important. How important is automated testing to quality? Because all types of tests, not just unit tests. Uh, it's very important. Again, my opinion on this is like the testing side, it's the last of my concerns. Because I think when you are developing, you already do the most important of the test yourself. Now, the automation aspect of it is because it helps me develop. You know, like that's one of the main reasons to write tests, unit tests. So it helps you develop. And I don't mean the TDD way and stuff like that. No, it's like if I want to change something, the faster way to test my change is to just run a unit test and not have to run an entire application. For me, that's the, that's the main benefit. So testing is important. Don't get me wrong. It's just that a lot of time people forget about it. Testing is not for testing. It's about automating it so you get the benefits during development. Which of the following statements do you agree with? Automated testing is less important than manual QA. Nope. Automated testing is equally as important as manual QA. Uh, nope. More important. Automated testing is a, re is a replacement for manual. Mm, it's not a replacement. It's not a replacement. Like, uh, as a... Like, even if you don't have dedicated people, which I don't think it's it's useful most of the time, you still, as a developer, need to do some manual thing. You know, like, I mean, you just developed it, make sure it, you know, before making the PR, make sure everything was expected. But after that, your unit test and screenshot test and like everything like that should, should have you covered. Which types of automated tests do you use on your personal hobbies? I don't write UI test. Well, did I write UI test? No, because I'm using the... No, not really. I mean, I have... I mean, integration test with... Yeah, if you consider the computer architecture tests. And UI tests... I mean, I have UI tests to take screenshots. So I guess that counts, but I don't run it as tests, to be honest. Which types of automated testing do you use in your business? So we have unit tests, we have integration tests, and we have UI tests. We don't have yet visual relation tests, because we, like I find that the UI changes so rapidly that it's the like it doesn't give you that much of a benefit. And also it gives you like there is some infrastructure maintenance that you need to to do so. Mm. Do you practice continuous delivery for your personal hobby? Uh, yes. For my personal hobby, yes. Uh, no, to the app store. I mean, to both, but to the uh, to the app store. Yeah. Because as I said in the one of the first questions, like, what's the release cadence of your personal hobby? Like, when I have time, you know. So. Mm -mm -mm. Ah, well, I guess I click this one. Do you practice continuous delivery in your... Uh, yes, we practice continuous delivery to a better list. Yeah, yeah we, we release to to Fabric every time. Every time we merge something on develop, we release to Fabric. And then every two weeks to the store. If you do continuous delivery to the app store, do you automate everything? Screenshots, no, because our... The design team wants to take over that, so yes, we don't do that. Do you use any analytics on your app? Yes, we have Firebase. 
this like we had fabric you know and fabric was very very good but they got acquired by google so basically we're kind of forced to move to to firebase you know it's not so and we already have google analytics and on android we have the the push notification system so it like you know it's it's a tool that covers a lot of use cases, so we, that's why we moved to it. I don't think it's the best one or anything like that. Do you use any of the following CI? Uh, yeah, I think we use Xcopy. We don't use Siemens. No, do no. We use Fastlane pretty extensively, like fully everything. We have everything automated. Xcode Server. We used it for some years. It was the worst decision ever made. So I'm super happy that we got rid of it. Jenkins, it's historically what everybody uses, and it's also like a no full thing that I don't want to see. Uh, Travis for open source, uh, but like I don't use that anymore to be honest. I, and now we use GitHub Actions, so that's cool. If you use a build server CI system, is it self hosted? It used to be, and that was the worst decision ever. Uh, hosted by a CI provider, yeah. We use Circle CI, which I'm quite happy with. For now, probably soon things are gonna change again, but for now we're in Circle CI. The App Store. There we go. What revenue models are you currently using for your personal hobbies? Completely free. I would like to do a deep chart donation thing, but yeah, I don't I don't want advertising. Paid up front, if it was something though that I had more time to put into, I would just go for paid up front. I don't care about the complexity of the rest, you know. Subscriptions, I think they overtook the App Store and it's insane. <laughs> like having to pay the amount of subscription that people, well, the developers pretend that we're gonna do it. It doesn't make any sense, honestly. I think it was, was a very bad decision. How strict do you feel that App Store games are? I feel they are not as strict as they should be. Not strict enough. Yeah. I think they are not strict enough. I think they should be more strict and, but like, like probably like two times more strict and a hundred times more clear, you know. It's that that that's a way of putting the way I, I I see it. You know, I don't have a problem with the way the app store is run in 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 the idea when it, like the same idea when it started as a curating place and stuff like that. But they are not strict with the things they should, and they are insanely strict with things that does, that should matter and that developers should have the right to do. So the first thing that they should do is clarify everything and apply the same rules everywhere. They say they do, but it's not true, you know. Have you enrolled? No, not really. I did like as again my my hobby projects. They don't make any. They are not to making money, so I don't really care as as of today. What is another good of revenue for Apple to take? I mean. I'm not even gonna answer this. I'm not even gonna answer this because it's like it's a super tricky question to answer. And of course, everybody's gonna say like nothing, <laughs> you know. Like every you, you, we are one that we get all the money, you know. But that's not how how life works, man. It's, people say thirty was fine when they released, but nowadays it's too much. I don't know. I maybe hope. I guess, but also like. These are the percentages like everywhere else, like in many other like stores and platforms. So I don't really buy that Apple needs to be different in this aspect. So yeah, I'm gonna skip this question. I'm sorry. How fair do you feel the process of being featured in the App Store? I mean, I don't have any concerns with that. I mean, like when I've been featured in the past, it was was fine and. If you're not featured, it's because there are so many applications and they are all so good that, I mean, tough life, you know, that it, you can only feature so much. Well, no, that's 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 not true. Since they since they added the way, like the possibility to, to reply, uh, we do it quite, like, I, we have part of the support team that does it quite often. Do you your business reply to customer reviews on the App Store? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. As I said, since they added that possibility, it makes more sense to take to take a look at that. Mm. on the public app store thank you so much so woo, that's it that took quite long that took quite long it was like 15 minutes but I guess 
talk so much and analyze every every question so much that yeah it took a lot of time i think it's been super interesting i i wish they asked a little bit more about some of the things around swift ui and the new frameworks and yeah ki kind of less about what you use and what are you gonna use but also like how you feel and what like for example the things about documentation that was really good that was really good because it's not about how do you use documentation it's like what do you think it's missing? What do you what, what do you want to be there? And I think it should have been the same for things like technologies, like Swift UI. What do you think it's missing? What is gonna take you to do that? For example, you know, like I haven't seen a question about once do you plan to drop support for all systems or how that impacts everything and stuff like that. You know, what could Apple do to to encourage that? Things like that. Even if the, the, this quest, this questionnaire is not from Apple, I think it would be really useful to know questions for that. Anyway, that's it for today. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Simona. Yeah, it, like the survey is really good. I encourage everybody to, to do it, to be honest. And I'm really interested in seeing the results. I don't know when they are gonna when they are gonna release the results, but we will keep an eye. And maybe like if people if people likes it, like we can do another stream just going over the results and see how much I disagree with all of them. Uh, that's gonna be that's gonna be an interesting one, yeah. But I think that's it. Well, it's been it's been it's been quite long, huh? quite long. I think that's it. Thank you, thank you all for watching. And that's it. See you next time. <laughs>